Thais, I speak here. Yeah. Uh, I think we have spent quite a bit of time talking about the foundation or the truth that the church has received. Yeah. And so what I'm going to do is that we are going to move on to another point about uh, the church being one. There's only one church. Okay. So again, this is a very uh, uh, sensitive uh, issue even to talk about it. All right. Now, I think you must have come across, you know, people like commenting uh, uh, on um, our church names, right? For example, like True Jesus Church, okay? Now, I think to, uh, I think to many people, yeah, the name True Jesus Church, uh, you know, is like, to them, you know, it sounds very offensive, it's off-putting, you know, and they, they cannot accept the fact that it's like, you know, we put ourselves like above, you know, all the other churches. And so, and for us to say that we are the only true church, and obviously, you know, we can also invite a lot of uh, uh, like problems unto ourselves, you know, and people straight away will say that we are cult, okay? Now, I think, I think um, nowadays, you know, right? uh, I think many Christians, uh, Christian included, always like, you know, associate a cult, you know, to, uh, uh, to be one who declare uh, himself to be the only one, like the only true church included, all right? So, um, now, I think I think it's important yeah, for us to understand we do not just go out and tell people that we are the only true church and all of you are, are false churches and you are condemned or whatever. No, we don't do that. But I think when we say uh, we are the only true churches for internal enhancement, well, we need to enhance our faith knowing that we are the only one uh, so that we have the full conviction to go forth uh, to, to preach the gospel. All right? Okay. Now, uh, we can look at the, like, the example given in we always say is that the Ark of Noah uh, represents or uh, prefigures the true church. Okay, now I think I think we um, we first need to uh, uh, find support you know, to this claim. Okay, now if you say the Noah's uh, Ark represents or uh, prefigures the the, the 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 true church, then the question is on what basis uh, do we say that? Okay, on what basis do we say that? Okay, uh, how do you know that? Uh, how do you know that the the Ark of Noah prefigures the true church? You cannot say, oh, because my preacher says so. Uh, so and so has told me, you know, I I I, I have heard about this uh, since young in the church, and this is what I have been taught. That's it. Amen. Full stop. No, you can't do that. Okay, now. What what you need to do is you you have to work on that. So right? you need to find uh, now when we talk about church yeah, and church, one of the the main tasks of the church is about saving. Okay, saving. Now when you look at the Ark of Noah, yes, it fulfills their requirements. Yeah, because the Ark of Noah saves. Right. Now I want you to look at uh, where is it. Uh, Uh, first Peter, yeah. Uh, we look at First Peter chapter three. Yeah. First Peter chapter three, we read uh, verse twenty. All right, twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, chapter three, verse twenty. All right. Now, who formerly were disobedient? When once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, uh, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Now, now, obviously, here it mentioned that you know the ark. I mean, the people were saved through water, right? Now, I think uh, what uh, Peter is doing is that he's trying to uh, connect uh, the deluge, you know, in the time of Noah to uh, the baptismal water or baptism, right? Baptism. But um, uh, we say factually speaking, when you look at uh, Genesis, right? 
you know, Noah and the family were saved by entering into the ark, right? So when the door was shut, then, you know, uh, um, the windows of heaven were open and the fountains uh, of the earth uh, were broken up and so water gushed up and, you know, deluged, uh, were coming down uh, from above. So like the ark was fully covered, right? No, so, but that's why the, the idea is, yeah, uh, whenever we talk about uh, salvation, it has uh, a lot to do with uh, baptism and also the church. These two are uh, inseparable. Now, in the Old Testament scriptures, when you look at the Ark of Noah, they enter into the Ark first and covered by water. And the only difference is in the New Testament, when we are baptized, we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into the church of God. Okay, now, so I think by looking at this, yeah, uh, the, uh, the example, if you like, or the analogy given by, by Peter, we can safely uh, conclude that, you know, uh, the Ark of Noah prefigures the church. Okay, now, so I think it's important, like what I said to you before, that you need to work on... Um, you need to work on uh, your own belief, all right? You, you do not just take on board everything that you have heard. And that is not uh, 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 the way forward, yeah? That's not the way forward, okay? So you need to really uh, know what you believe in. And to do that, you know, you need to search and, and find out um, more for yourself, okay? Now, if, if, if that... Uh, uh, is what you believe in as well, then if you look at Ark, yeah, there's only one Ark, and we know that Ark prefigures the church. Now, in, in today's world, you know, it, I believe it is all, always more effective yeah, if you have more people to proclaim the same message, to reach out to more people. Now, meaning, if God has raised up uh, how many? Uh, ten Noahs, all right? To build ten arcs, then I believe that you know the world there would be would be shaken. Why? Because so many people out there were building arcs. Yeah, and it goes to show that you know something is serious or or is going to happen. Okay, but you find that God is is absolute. All right, He has only chosen one person, one family. To build one up. Right? Just by looking at the this Old Testament scriptures is very, very clear to us that in the mind of God, He is going to use just one up to save. All right? Now it's singular. So what happened when um, the up was uh, completed? And so on the day that they entered into the ark, the flood came. Right, and the world was judged. And in fact, we also see that according to Second Peter, you know Noah was also called a preacher of righteousness. So he went about telling people, you know, the judgment of God is looming, it's coming soon, you know, it's just around the corner. So it's now the time for you to turn over a new leaf, and so on and so forth. But very unfortunately, you know, people at the time turned a deaf ear to the advice of Noah. None of them willing to, uh, to come to the ark and be saved, right? One ark, absolute. Right? Now, so I think from the very beginning, you, we can uh, see the mind of God, you know, in terms of salvation, how he would carry out his plan of salvation. In fact, one up and then one chosen race, you know, all the way down. One, 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 one. Okay. Now I just want to tell you um, an experience that I, I I had, you know, in talking to a group of truth seekers. And there was one time, you know, in London Church, we we had a, uh, we had an informal uh, like evangelistic service. You know, we we invited uh, some uh, truth seekers to come. So we sit around the table. So about I think it's about I can't remember about six or seven of them <laughs> they came. 
And so we, we had an informal chat, you know, I did a, a short message. And and I was given the topic on the one true church. So I talked about the one true church. You know, after the uh, the short message, there was a lady, but she has been to the church many times, you know. Only then, on that occasion, I realized that she was not really serious. Right? Because we have been uh, preaching to her, you know, telling her the right way of salvation. And I did not know the, uh, the intention of her coming to the church yeah, every week. You know? And so when we spoke about the true church after that, you know, she questioned, are you saying that, you know, are you saying that, you know, all the other churches out there, they cannot be saved. Only one church can be saved. All right. But we have already mentioned about, you know, verses from the scriptures or whatever, you know, you know, you know, it's like, she was using some some uh, how can viewpoint of humanism you know to to try to to uh, counter the, the the teachings of the scriptures okay so in fact uh, you know it was quite uh, it was quite chaotic at the time because she kept talking you know so many churches there are so many good people out there many good christian you know how can you say they are not safe that kind of thing all right. Uh, so obviously, you know, after 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 that, you know, we ask her a question. We ask her a series of questions. So we said to her, "Do you believe in the teaching of the scriptures?" Said, yeah, yeah, of course, I I, I do, I do. Uh, what about the story of the Bible? I said, yeah. What about Noah? I said, yeah. So we ask her, you know, uh, how many people entered into the ark? He said, eight. What happened to the rest of the people in the world? Then. She kept quiet. They all died. Can we therefore say, God, you are not fair, no? why do you kill all these people? No. We say God is absolute. And God has sent what Noah to preach to them. None of them believed. None of them, you know, wanted to enter into the ark. That's why they all perished in the water. They all died. So, you know, like what I've said to you before, never use what is relative to challenge what is absolute. We can't because God is an absolute God. His, his doing is always the best. So we can't challenge. If he said one, means one. Who are we to say? Uh, oh, there may be two or three out there, you know. No, we don't do that. So when we say we believe in God, yeah, we have to believe in his absoluteness. Now, what does it mean to believe in God? Do you only believe that He exists, or do you believe in everything that He said is absolute? These are two different things altogether. I can tell you I believe in God, but I don't believe in everything that He said. And that is not faith. But for us, we have to believe that you know, whatever He says is absolute. If He said one, then we have to we accept that there's only one church. You cannot use what humanism or, or, or what, what a human supposition to superimpose upon the will of God. What happened? Our faith will collapse. Right? So we must allow the word, the, the idea of God, you know, the, the word of the scriptures to reign supreme. Because only the word of God can save. If the Bible says there's only one, there is one. All right? Now, you know, seriously, because if you are a business person and you could have said, you know, God should have, you know, get 10 more people to build 10 arts, you know? Why? In, in marketing terms, you, you invite more people to come. You, 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 uh, you arouse intention, awareness. But that is not the way of the Lord. One means one. Okay? So, all of you must have faith in the word of God that there is only one church. You know, if you cannot believe this, then it's, it's 
to be honest, for me, okay, it's pointless to learn other doctrines. What is the point of learning other doctrines? Right? It's pointless, seriously. Because you don't believe that there is only one body in the first place. Okay? Now, when you look at the move on yeah, to another uh, historical uh, uh, fact, you know, after they came out from Egypt, we know that like what we say yes, that God has chosen for himself one group of people, yeah, one group of people. And when you look at the New Testament scriptures, and this idea actually was uh, well uh, elaborated, if you like, yeah, by Stephen, the one who was uh, stoned to death. Okay? Now, we turn to Acts of the Apostle and see what he says. Yeah? Uh, chapter 7, we read uh, verse uh, uh, 38. Chapter 7, verse 38. Now, this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel, uh, who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our Father, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. Okay, now, if you look at the word congregation again, if you, uh, how can I say? If you look at the, the, the footnotes given, yeah, or if you uh, check it up, yeah, and you find that the original text or the original words for congregation is actually church, ecclesia. Okay? Now, so uh, I think mine is very clear ecclesia, assembly, or church. Uh, so in the mind of Stephen, uh, he was moved by, obviously, by the Holy Spirit to understand that, you know, the, the church of God at the time of Moses was in the, in the wilderness. Was in the wilderness. That group of people whom God has chosen formed the church of God in the wilderness. Right? Now, I think the verses that we mentioned yeah, is like uh, those who have been chosen are like the whole holy nation, royal priesthood, you know, you know the kingdom of God, you know, that kind of thing. All right? Now, but before that, before, before they went out, you know, it's like the Bible never said, said that they were together form a church. No. According to the New Testament scriptures, only after they had gone out of Egypt. Now, a simple question, yeah, a simple question. When they went out of Egypt, yeah, you know the route that they, they, they took is they must, what? they must cross the Red Sea. Now, in the mind of Paul, crossing the Red Sea is a baptismal experience. Okay, now we turn to 1 Corinthians. First uh, Corinthians chapter ten. We read uh, verse one and verse two. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter ten, verse one and verse two. Now, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All pass through the sea. Now, verse 2. Uh, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, so according to Paul, yeah, crossing the Red Sea, you know, is a form of baptism. Right? Now, so when we join these uh, two passages together, Acts and uh, uh, First Corinthians together, then we begin to realize that, you know, they were called the church in the desert precisely because they have crossed the Red Sea. You know what happened? You know, all the best soldiers, you know, the army, the pursuing armies of Pharaoh were drowned in the Red Sea. All this died, you know, all this, what we call um, uh, enemies of the chosen people of God uh, were put away. Right? Now, so quite clearly, 
you know, the church uh, was only formed after they crossed the rest, after they were redeemed. You know, the point of redemption, according to the New Testament scriptures, is when they were crossing the Red Sea. Okay? So, this is like a kind of baptism. It's like a kind of baptism to us. So, when we talk about the one church, yeah? Now, any church, we understand that if the baptism is not correct, then that church is never a church. In the first place, in the eyes of God, it's not, it's not a church. Because according to the definition that we, we, we mentioned about, it's a group of people whom God has bought with his own blood. So we see that there's only one baptism. Right? Any baptism that is not accurate cannot cause a person to be enjoined into the body of Christ. Not possible. Not at all. Right? Now, so by looking at this, yeah, we understand that you know the church actually, uh, this one church of God yeah, was formed when baptism is carried out in accordance to the scriptures, when a person is redeemed yeah, by the blood of Christ. Now, so we move on. Now we come to uh, Matthew. We come to Matthew chapter 16. Okay, Matthew chapter 16, yeah? All right, we look at uh, verse 18, all right? Now, here God is going to uh, reveal, you know, like the mystery uh, to Peter. That's right? something that he has not done before, yeah? Okay, now verse 18. And I also said to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Okay, now... God, you know, you know, uh, what can I say? Like, Jesus is saying to Peter, you know, the, the meaning of the word Peter, the name Peter means small rock, right? Okay, now, but Jesus said, on this rock, meaning like on himself, yeah, um, uh, he will build his church. Now, I just want you to look at, you know, uh, the statement, yeah, I will build my church. So the building up of the church is the work of God. Yeah, and it can never be done by man himself, not possible. This is the work of God. Okay, this is the work of God. Now, and also, he said, My church and the church belongs to Jesus. So that's why no one can lay claim over the ownership of the church. Right? We, we can only be thankful to God for being part of the church of God. We cannot lay claim over the ownership of the church because none of us has established the church. It is God who has done it for us. Okay, now the next point is, you find that in this verse itself, it says, my church is singular, is one. Okay, now, so Jesus never once says that he's going to build churches for himself. Now, if you look at the, the Apostolic Church, yeah, right? we said uh, from a, a universal level, if there is only one church, because all these people who believe in Jesus, they were baptized by the same Spirit. Yes, they were baptized by different workers, but it was the Spirit who uh, was present yeah, to make sure that their baptism is accurate, is, is, effect, is efficacious is effective for the, for the remission of sin. Okay? Now, when you look at the true Jesus Church, uh, it's the same. You know, and uh, from this uh, universal level, yes, we only have one church because we preach the same message, we receive the same Holy Spirit. But if you talk about individual uh, locality, then we have many uh, congregations. Right? But we all share the same faith. And this is identical to the church in the time of the apostles. But in the spirit, there is only one church, one church, who share the same faith, who receive the same Holy Spirit, and who has gone through the same baptism. 
right? One. Now, the other thing is, yeah, if you look at the, the 16, yeah, verse 18, yeah, just to highlight it to you, again, um, I should have included this, uh, you know, when we talk about the foundation, when we talk about the foundation. Okay, he said, on this rock, now, when the Bible talks about the rock, yeah, it's like with a definite article in front, it means that there is only one. But here is it on this rock, yeah? Now, you find that in the Old Testament scriptures, there is only one rock. We must not think that there are many rocks, you know? <laughs> not like yeah, today we say, oh, uh, there are so many rocks, you know? No. In the scriptures, when it said the rock means one, there is only one. It's absolute. Okay, so let's look at uh, some verses in, in the Old Testament scriptures, yeah? And this rock actually is God himself. We turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Um, we read uh, chapter 32. Right, we first read verse 4, yeah? Verse 4. Right, now he is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of truth. And without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Okay, here, you know, in the Song of Moses, uh, he mentioned that God is the rock. He is the rock. So there is only one rock. Right? If God is the rock, then no one else is the rock. Okay, now, I also want you to read, uh, where is it? Um, at this rock, uh, sometimes uh, some, uh, sometime it's also called the rock of salvation. Now we read uh, verse 15, the same chapter, uh, verse 15, yeah? Okay, and then we also read uh, verse 18, yeah, verse 15. Now, but Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese, then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. The rock of his salvation. Now, verse 18. Of the rock who begot you, you are unfaithful. Now, so, and this is the rock who has fathered us right so it's god himself now so when you see you know when we say we build uh, this church upon the rock what does it mean we build the, the church upon jesus christ okay there's only one rock it's clear now in fact you know isaiah echoes uh, you know the same ideas now we turn to uh, isaiah chapter um, uh, 44, yeah? Now, Isaiah chapter 44. We read uh, verse 8, right? Verse 8. Do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Okay, so bear this in mind, whenever the Bible says God is the rock, means there is only one. So one rock, one church. Just like one God and one body. Jesus is the head and he has only one body. That's the idea. One rock, one church. Now you can imagine you know, if a person you know, has one head but with many bodies, what would you say of this person? Weird. It's not so? Now you, we are like suggesting you know, God has one head and with many bodies. If you do not believe that you know, the TJC is the only true church, it's like saying that God has many bodies. Does it make sense to you? No, it doesn't. Okay, All right? Okay, now back to uh, the New Testament scriptures now. Yeah? Uh, we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians again, chapter 10.
Uh, we read uh, verse 4. Yeah? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, verse 4. And all drank the same spirit, spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, so the rock is Christ. So when Jesus said, will build my church upon this rock, he's saying he will build his church upon himself. So one head, one body, one rock, one church. Can you see the, the, the consistency you know, uh, of the scriptures in terms of this teaching? But there is no two, okay? One only. So I think by looking at the scriptures, uh, we need to have faith in the word of God, all right? Uh, you know, our faith should be built upon what the Bible says rather than what man says to you about the church. Okay, it should come from the scriptures. There's only one. Okay, now uh, we can also look at the uh, uh, Ephesians. Yeah, I think this uh, is uh, a very uh, commonly used uh, verse, right? Chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, verse 4, yeah? Verse 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Now, I think, I think the statement here uh, looks very simple, but I think it demonstrates the great wisdom of God because like what we said yesterday, the spirit of God is unquantifiable. But here, you know, Paul obviously was moved by uh, God to say that, you know, by the Spirit to say that there's only one Spirit. And this unquantified Spirit, yeah, is one. And where does He live? In the one body. Right? In the one body. You, you, get, you get what I'm saying? Yes? To live in this one body is the conscious choice of God. He has chosen to live in this one body. That's why it's one. Okay, now I think this will throw up, uh, you know, a questions that I think you know sometimes it can be confusing as well. You know, I guess that uh, you may need to uh, know the answer, you know, to these questions. I think the question, the co this question is quite commonly asked. You know, if TJC is the only true church, yeah, we have the Holy Spirit. What about other churches? Do they have the Holy Spirit? Do they have the Holy Spirit? I think we have been asked, you know, uh, uh, repeatedly, you know. Now, do they have the Holy Spirit? No. I think it's, again, yeah, judging when you look at chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 4, one spirit or one body and one spirit. The indication is clear. If I ask you, where is your spirit? Of course, it's in your body. Your spirit cannot come to my body. Is that not true? Right? So the spirit of God obviously lives in his own body, the church, the church whom he has purchased with his own blood. This is absolute, you know. That's why we must not allow anything relative, to, you know, to dilute what is absolute. So when we say we have faith in the word of God, it's not just to read the Bible, oh, okay, okay, I accept. You have to believe in the absoluteness of God. There's only one. Today is getting more and more difficult for us to believe that there's only one church because of the pressure from our whiff. You know, if you say you're the only true church, you know, sometimes people may ask, you know, after you have, pre you have preached to them, you know what they said? Are you saying that you are the only true church? What is your answer to that? I think most of us, we shut our mouth. We don't want to say too much. But we have to tell them, I'm sorry, yeah, we are the only true church. But when you say that, what happened? They say, oh, this guy is so proud. That's weird, yeah, square-minded. You know, all sort of name will be given to you. Right? Now, so again, 
again, we don't care about what people would say about us. You know, obviously we try to be nice and gentle, you know, and kind or whatever, you know, to them. Yeah. And the most important thing is we need to know what the Bible says. There's one. There's only one spirit and one body. Now, coming back to the questions, yeah. Do you think other churches also have the Holy Spirit? You know, if you were to ask me, my answer is no. Straightforward. Not possible. Okay? Now, from, from the establishment of the, the church in the time of the apostle, yeah, uh, if you look at you know, the church, Jesus asked them to, to, to tarry in Jerusalem to, until what? Um, until all of them are undue with power from one high, right? Okay? Then, what happened? They would, after that, they went out to preach, isn't it? They went out to preach and preach and preach and people came to believe. You'll find that anyone, yeah, who received the Holy Spirit must go through the church. Can you quote me an example in the Acts of the Apostle yeah, in which a person received the Holy Spirit without any context with uh, an agent from the apostolic line. No, you can't find an example. In fact, all the examples tell us that whoever wants to receive the Holy Spirit must go through the church. Now, I just want to single out one very important example. Yeah? If you look at the conversion of Paul, his conversion to me and to many Christians was spectacular, if I can put it that way. Why? Because he was at the peak of his rebellions against the church of God. And at that point in time, he was chosen. He was brought down to his knees. Okay? And you can see that God even spoke to him. You know? And even told him why he had persecuted him. God had a conversation with him. But did God give him the Holy Spirit at the point in time? No. And God said to what? Him to go and see someone called Ananias. And Ananias was also told by God to go and meet this Paul. Only then he was given the Holy Spirit. Right? You find that God was, was, uh, was an orderly God. He would not create confusion for himself. He will not create confusion for his own church. It's very clear. You know, if someone, if someone, you know, comes into the church, you know, who has never heard about the gospel of salvation and tell you that, you know, he or she has the Holy Spirit, you dismiss it. But you don't have to tell, ah, you not true, not true, you know, like argue with the person. No, don't need to do that. You, you know, because today they are so... How can I say? There's so much confusion now in the world. I tell you, there are some Christian, yeah, the way they pray, yeah, they also pray in tongue, you know. And sometimes it, sound, it sounds like us, to be honest with you. But can you therefore say, oh, look, they also have the Holy Spirit? No. They have to pray again. All right? Now, let me just give you an example, yeah. You know, you know we... Uh, there was one time, yeah, we went to preach to a group of um, youngsters, right? Youngsters. And so when we when we arrived there, we went with a deacon, you know, to preach. And the youngsters, you know, said to us, "Please don't tell me about the Holy Spirit. I I already have the Holy Spirit, you know, because I'm from the Pentecostal faith. So no need to tell me about the Holy Spirit." I said, oh, okay, okay. If you don't want to talk about the Holy Spirit, talk about baptism. And so we talk about baptism, we explain, you know. And after that, we also talk about the Sabbath. You know, before we conclude, yeah, we said to them, you know, six of them. So I said, why not we pray together? Right? So we, we taught them how to pray, you know, taught them how to pray. So surprisingly, during the prayer, we did not even lay hands on them. We did not even lay hands. Because in our mind, at first, because uh, they did not believe in the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit that we wanted to tell them about. So we didn't lay hands. And then halfway through the prayer, we could hear two of them spoke in tongue. And very loudly, 
in our heart, yeah, actually after that, you know, we talk to one another. Even during the prayer, we could, we could hear that, you know, the tongues right, are similar to ours. We're quite curious, you know. So after the prayer, we ask him, hey, uh, you know, what happened, you know, during the prayer? And they said, you know, I received the Holy Spirit. Now the tongue is different. So from here, you can see, yeah, you know, that yes, other churches may claim that they have the Holy Spirit, but we have to use the word of God to measure against their claim. We cannot just say, oh, you see the way they pray, huh? Are very, it's very identical to ours. You look at the way they, they speak in tongues. Oh, it's similar. No, you don't judge like this. It's not the way. One church, one spirit. One body, one spirit. And we also understand, yeah, the Bible says that in Ephesians, the fullness of God, the, com the complete God, dwells in this one body, the church. And that is the conscious choice of God. He has never chosen to dwell in any other places aside from Mount Zion, the passage that we have, we have read. The book of Psalms chapter 132. And that is going to be his everlasting place. Okay, so there is only one church, one church. So I think, I think you know, if, if we are all grounded, you know, in, in the word of God, then I think, you know, the more you read into the scriptures, the more you will find that, you know, the teachings of the church are true. The doctrines of the church are accurate. You will begin to grow in faith more and more. Obviously, there are many questions, you know, posed against our belief. But, but if we firmly believe in what we have received, then we can answer all questions with the help of God. We may not be able to answer them, you know, instantly, then, then, when we are asked, but we believe that we can answer. That is the faith that we need to have, yeah, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now, so... I think before we pray, I want to read uh, one more passage in the scriptures. Uh, we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, we read uh, verse 13. Eh? Okay, verse 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Now, the, the baptism here is water baptism, okay? Uh, we should uh, paraphrase it this way. For by one spirit, we were all water baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now, the second part is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. But the first part is water baptism. Okay, now that's why we believe that, you know, when we do baptism, the, the spirit is always there to, to, to incorporate or to enjoin a person into his body, right? Now, the point I'm making is anyone who wants to be this one body of Christ must be baptized, right? Now, that's why if baptism is not correct, then there's, you find that the person who is baptized that can never be part of the body of Christ. If the Spirit is not there, then surely the person who is baptized cannot be part of the body of Christ. So even when we talk about baptism, the one, the, the, I would say the human Baptist must be sent by the church of God. If you look at the, what, the early church, uh, this is what was done. That all those who carried out baptism actually were sent by the church. Right? God is a God of order. So one church only. Okay. Now, uh, so I think tomorrow we will, uh, um, we will talk about, you know, the prophecy concerning the, the coming out of the church. Yeah, based on the Old Testament scriptures.
We're going to look at some passages uh, from the Old Testament scriptures. Okay, now uh, we are going to pray. Uh, we give thanks to God. We are going to pray for 10 minutes. Uh, all right, uh, let's kneel down to pray. <laughs>